you know, I was thinking about when my search for real began in earnest, and I think it was in 1969 when I was 21 years old. Oh, let me ask a question. How many of you, like me, were teenagers during the, sometime during the 60s? How many of you were teenagers? Oh, that's depressing. Jeez. There were more of you in 1997. We're dwindling. Okay, then how many of you weren't even born in the 60s yet? Can I see your hands? Oh, I resent you for that. I'm just telling you. How many of you were a teenager in the 60s but don't remember it? Oh. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, by the end of 1969, I had been married and divorced, and I had a two-year-old baby boy. And I was working in, as a receptionist in a law office making $55 a week. I can remember, some of you may be able to relate, I can remember cashing in bottles to get enough money for gas for my car. Yeah, I can remember eating bologna sandwiches by candlelight with my baby boy because my electricity had been turned off yet again. And also, to further complicate things at that particular time in my life, I was uh, suffering from clinical depression. I was uh, having very frequent and serious debilitating panic and anxiety attacks that were so horrific sometimes that I seriously, seriously came close to taking my own life, more times than I can recount. And such was the situation on the morning of December 7th, 1969. I woke up, fell headfirst into that dark, frightening place. And I remember lying in bed with the covers pulled up around my neck and I remember thinking to myself, I can't take this anymore. And then the words started playing in my mind like they were on a loop and I heard them, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to die. Now, I need you to remember those words because they come back just a moment in this story. Well, it was just about that time that I heard my son stirring in the room next to me and I realized that I had to make it. So, summoning courage from I don't know where, I pulled myself up, I got dressed, I got him dressed and off to daycare, went to that law office, sat behind that desk, hanging on to my sanity by a thread. And it was about 11.30 in the morning, that morning, that in through the front door burst a man in a convict's prison uniform brandishing a 357 Magnum. He grabbed me by the arm. He slammed the gun in my face. And he said to the two attorneys who were standing there at the time, give me your car keys, give me your money. I'm leaving, I'm taking her with me, don't call the cops or I will kill her. Now I want you to think back for just a moment to the emotional state that I was in before the man came in the room. <laughs> Remember that one? By the way, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a 357 Magnum or not, but here is what one looks like. That is not, however, what it looks like when it's about two inches from your face. No, no, then it looks something like that. <laughs> well, he took me to an abandoned house and there he held me hostage for five hours. And I guess I had what Vince Pacenti would have called one of life's defining moments. It happened actually about two hours into this, he had allowed me to sit in a chair in the living room and he sat in a chair facing me about eight feet away. He sat there just gripping that gun staring at me, not saying a word. And I have to tell you, I have searched for the longest time on how to help people understand what I was experiencing in that moment. And then Scott Halford said something the other day that made me connect with something that might demonstrate that. Imagine, this is how I felt while I was watching him with that gun, imagine what it would feel like if you had your head in a guillotine and you were there knowing that the blade was going to fall any moment. But the only difference was you were turned around face up so you could see the blade 
glimmering and anticipate its fall. That's what it felt like. Suddenly, at one point, he, out of nowhere, slowly raised the gun. He pointed it directly between my eyes. He cocked the hammer. He took a deep breath, and his exact words were, are you ready to die? Well, there was a part of me that wanted to say, funny you should mention that. <laughs> Whoa, ta, I was just thinking about, are you psychic? What? <laughs> well, I didn't say that, but in that moment, I got it. I got two huge things. Number one, no, no, I was not ready to die. Oh, but isn't it ironic that only what, seven hours earlier, not only did I think I was, but I was ready to take my own life? <laughs> Be very careful what you wish for. <laughs> And the second thing I got in that moment was that if I was going to get out of this alive, I had to get this guy to trust me. I had to develop some kind of rapport, some kind of relationship, so that he would let his guard down just enough so that I could find the opportunity to escape. And that's what happened. Five hours later, no one rescued me. He didn't let me go. I escaped. And yes, it took me quite some time to recover from this. But I will tell you, this is the conclusion I ultimately came to. As horrific as this was, as, as unimaginable and horrifying, it actually became the greatest gift I had ever been given in my lifetime. For one thing, I saw clearly that I did want to live. And that Awareness for the first time in many, many months was deliciously real to me.